and welcome to the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sorelli. This one actually is a first. We're not live from, usually we record, Coach, at a bar called Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. I, I won't <laughs> tell you what that actually uh, uh, means uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're actually coming live from Tropo in East Lansing with a man I highly respect, Mel Tucker, head coach of the Michigan State football team. Hey, first off, 11-2, and two, congrats on the season. Yeah, That's amazing, man. Yeah, thanks, bro. It was a, it was a, it was a step in the right direction for us, and and uh, but I'm excited to be with you, man. And we are humbled to to have you here. Uh, you know, for those listening, uh, Mel and I, and I will call, I'll refer to you as coach because I hold that that term dear, and we're, we're going to talk about that. Uh, coach and I were able to sit down for about an hour and talk about leadership and culture, and, and much of this podcast is going to be the uh, the same thing. But I mean, you've had one hell of a career. I mean, from college football, playing at Wisconsin, to coaching. Well, well, it's interesting. You started at Michigan State with Nick Saban. I did. I did. And now you're back here. Uh, The NFL, but what most Michigan State fans never ask about or or really explore is, who's Mel Tucker? Like, (laughs) give us a background of where you're born, you know, your your younger years, what led you you here? Yeah, so... um, I was born and raised in the Cle- in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I went to uh, Cleveland Heights High School, and uh, you know I was a three sport uh, guy there for for quite some time. Um, three sport. And, uh, and what were the three? Well, sports? I was I was football, basketball, and baseball, and then um, and then uh, I just focused on football and basketball um, in in high school, and uh, I was very fortunate to uh, to get a scholarship to uh, University of Wisconsin. I was in Barry Alvarez's first recruiting class in uh, in 1990. We were one in ten my freshman year. You know, it was crazy. One in ten, five and six, five and six, and, and then and then Rose Bowl. And uh, so, I mean, that's where I first, I mean, where I got my first real taste of turning a program around. I was right there. I saw Coach Alvarez do that. Uh, you know, at a at a place where. Not a lot of people thought that, that 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 would happen that way, and obviously with Wisconsin, the rest is history. Um, but uh, I graduated in, in May of '95 with a, a ag business degree, and in uh, 1997, I began my coaching career here at Michigan State uh, with Nick Saban as as a graduate assistant. Coach Saban recruited me uh, when I was in high school. Yeah, he was a head coach at the University of Toledo. I come home from school one day. And uh, phone rings, I pick it up, and it says, hey, Mel. And I say, yeah. He said, this is Nick Saban from the Houston Oilers. I'm like, Houston Oilers? I'm a singer in high school, man. What, what's going on here? Yeah. And he, he goes on to say, I just took the head job at Toledo where your dad played. My dad's in the Hall of Fame there for football and, and, uh, and baseball. And uh, you're one of my top recruits, and, and uh, you know, I want to you know, come see you. you know? So that's how our relationship started. Um, he was regarded at the time as one of the best defensive backs coach defensive back coaches in, in, in the game, college or pro. So when I decided that I wanted to coach and be a defensive backs coach, I called Coach Saban. He was here at Michigan State, and uh, he remembered me, and he hired me as one of his GAs, and that's really how my coaching career started. Do you consider Nick one of your foremost mentors? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Three of the first four years in coaching, I was with Coach Saban. Yep. He, he laid the foundation for me. Um, in coaching, not just coaching, but recruiting, um, you know, CEO, you know, organization, yeah. building, culture, uh, that type of thing. Um, it was two years here at uh, Michigan State and a year, his first year at LSU. So I, I want to go back because you said you were three sports. And, and it's amazing. Sometimes you end up in the sport that you don't necessarily love the most. You know, I look at like Michael Jordan, <laughs> right. the greatest <clears throat> basketball player in history. Without a bit. Uh, I would agree. And uh, maybe that's just because it was our era. <laughs> that's uh, right. Watching that's right. Him. Uh, but he loved baseball. What, what was your favorite sport? I, I, love, I love football. Yeah. I really did. I, you know, I was raised as a football player um, in Ohio. You, you don't, as a, as, a, as a boy, I don't think you have a choice. I can't remember making a conscious decision to play football. That's just kind of what you do. Um, and, uh, and, and my dad played in college. And so... You know, he kind of showed me the ropes early, but I loved basketball. Uh, I loved uh, baseball. 
Um, but I, I will say I, I had a – from an early age, I had a passion for football. So it sounds a lot like Texas, you know, the, the Midland – uh, area you're you're growing up football no matter what. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. You know, I spent I spent many days in the in the uh, municipal stadium in the in the dog pound before it was branded the dog pound, and uh, you know catching the bus to games and never leaving early, no matter how cold it was, right there on the lake. And uh, I mean the cardiac kids, you know Brian Sype, you know all those guys. I mean I, I mean that's what I, that's how I grew up. So you did. Gloss over one thing, I'm going to bring it up. Because, of course, we do our research before we come out. You got recruited into the Canadian Football League yep. out of Wisconsin. Yep. But you came down with, was it chicken pox? I did, yeah, I did, yeah. I, so I, I graduated um, from, uh, from Wisconsin, and uh, there was probably a two- or three-week period – uh, where or maybe a week or so where I where I had to go home before I reported to Hamilton, and uh, during that time, my youngest brother we're all eight years apart. My youngest brother had the chicken pox, you know, back home with my parents, and so, um, uh, you know, I tried to stay away from him, obviously, and, and I thought I was good. And should I get up to Hamilton and, you know, about a week into the deal, I realized this is not a good situation, you know. So, you know, uh, so that was pretty much the end of end of my. Uh, into my career, I think I went from about two hundred and five pounds to about one hundred and fifty five pounds. You're kidding me. Yeah, it was. It was in the a, in the hospital. I'm assuming if you were losing that much weight. Yeah, I was. You know, I, w- I went. I was. I went. Um, you know, back. I went back home, and uh, you know, I, I think I had an allergic reaction to some to some medication, and where I, I lost I lost a whole bunch of weight, and uh, but you know, I was able to recover, but that ultimately kind of ended my my coaching career, my my playing career. How did you deal with that? Because, I mean, you had dedicated and you have dedicated your life to the sport. Sure. But at the time, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm assuming at that time you just loved to actually be on the field and play. And to have to deal with a decision that, well, that door is now closed. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was one of the toughest decisions that I ever had to make. Um, I didn't want to be one of those guys that was, uh, you know, bouncing around from team to team, league to league, you know, working out forever, trying to make it. Um, I just decided that, hey, it's just not in the cards for me, and it's time for me to move on and, and do something else. But um, uh, probably the most difficult thing for me was to tell, was to tell my dad, yeah. you know, that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm hanging it up. And, uh, and his reaction was, uh, was, was the opposite of what I thought it was going to be. He, was, he wasn't disappointed. He was actually kind of relieved and happy for me, like, okay, he was like, I get it. You know, uh, it ended for me. It's ended for you. And, and there's more to life than than actually playing a game of football. And he was very supportive. And and he was just I think he was just happy that I had enough confidence uh, in myself to know that I could I could move on and do something else. You know, I know there's going to be a lot of young Michigan State students that listen to this. Now, this next part of the story is I, I love this. So you ended up as a next job selling meat and steaks from door to door. Yeah, I did. I did. To, just explain to me, in your <laughs> head, what's going on? I mean, I don't want to say, hey, was that a low point in your life? Yeah. But, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not what yeah. you had envisioned. Yep. For those young students that step out of the university, yeah. even your football players, where they're not going to go on to the NFL. Right. What do you do? I mean, do you tell them about that story in, in – in, I'd be even more, what were you feeling? But what did you learn from that job right there? Oh, that might have been one of the, the best jobs that, that I ever had, um, uh, quite frankly. So, yeah, I mean, I actually was a volunteer football and basketball coach at my high school and a substitute teacher, um, and then I needed to make money. I was, I was living at home with my parents, and, uh, and I, I answered an ad in the paper. You know, back in the day, you look in the paper, you know, the, the ads, and, the, you know, I – it said cash at the end of at the end of every day. So I go and and uh, I go to this warehouse on the west side, and these guys had these uh, these pickup trucks with these freezers on the back of them, and they was they were uh, they were having sales meetings every morning, you know, teaching folks how to sell how to sell food, and I said, shoot, I can do that. And uh, you know, I went out with a guy on the truck. Uh, one day he says, you know, I'll let you go out with me on one condition. He says, you don't say a word. 
He says, because when you walk in, they're going to think you don't know anything. But if you start talking, they'll know you don't know anything. <laughs> Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I saw the guy. I mean, the guy emptied his truck in about three hours. And uh, I said, no, that's, that's definitely something I can do. And I, I started to do that. It was actually, uh, actually, it, it was, uh, I got the food on consignment. And I actually uh, shopped around and found a better, a, a better uh, deal on the food, a better price, and uh, I kind of really went into business for myself, actually. And uh, you know, I lease a truck, and I, you know, I go down and pull, yeah, pull the food out of Gateway Cold Storage, and go grab the dries, and, and I go hit it, and and uh, and I did that for for over a year. And um, I read I read a lot of sales books, and uh, and uh, it was it was direct sales, no advertising, door to door, you know. Work, you know, learn how to get repeat business, you know, to get through those those winners in the in Cleveland, Ohio, you know. Well, sal- salesmen, saleswomen have a you know particular set of skills. They're very personal. Did you consider yourself a personal guy before you went into that role, or is that something you had to work on? Yeah, I thought I was I was I was a nice guy and a friendly guy, um, kind of reserved on uh, on the shy side. But you know, I had to learn quickly that. You know, I, I had to get out of that mode, you know, because when you go to a door, you, you go in a cell, um, you know, they don't know that you've, they don't know that you're reserved. They don't know you're shy. They don't, they don't know that you've already been to, you know, knock on 50 doors. All they know is what they see at that, that particular moment, like who you are and, you know, what you're all about. And it was, uh, it was, at first I didn't have very much product knowledge. It was all enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. And then, so I, 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 I survived on enthusiasm. And then once my product knowledge kind of caught up, then I was kind of cooking with gas. And so, um, you know, energy, you know, enthusiasm, you know, kind of, uh, kind of wins the day. And, and I, I learned, I learned to, to bring the energy. Um, again, like we talked about earlier, you have, to, you have to do things based upon what needs to be done, not based upon how you feel all the time. Yeah, feelings, uh, it seems like our culture is really defaulting to, uh, to feelings. And ultimately, we know that it's all about outcomes. It's and all I'm, about outcomes. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're going to get to that. Did you learn to deal with rejection? Oh, well, man. Oh, I mean, uh, that, I'm not even sure if, that's, if, that's, if that describes it. I mean, it was beyond rejection. I mean, you know, my, my goal every day was to knock on 100 doors. You know, that, that was my goal. And, uh, you know, and direct sales and, you know, just cold calling, you're going to get you're going to get told no a lot. And sometimes it's not going to be very polite, you know, in terms of, you know, how they tell you, yeah. like, to get the hell out of here. You know, what I mean, you know, I'm knocking on doors. Right. And uh, and so um, the re- the rejection part was something that I really had to uh, I hadn't I hadn't had a lot of that. I mean, I, had, I hadn't been told no. Uh, very many times because you were highly recruited. Yeah, you, you, Canadian Football League. Yeah, yeah you don't. You're not getting told no, or or you're you're not good enough, or that's or whatever it is. And so, um, so I had to handle that. I learned that it wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. And uh, if I knocked on enough doors, you know, if I was relentless and I just would just, you know, not stop, um, you know, then I can get the job done. But when they did let me in. When they when they when they would say okay let me see what you got, you know after I've knocked on forty doors like I got to make that sale like it's, this has got to have I got to bring it I got I got to close and so it was uh it was it was it was quite an it was quite an experience and uh, I mean I would I would actually recommend that uh, to to almost anyone to to do it at least for you know a year you know especially in the Midwest go through all the seasons. You know, and uh, you learn a lot about yourself uh, when you're in, uh, in any type of direct sales. Did you ever calculate your success rate starting out and where you ended up towards the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, when I first started, um, I was just trying to, to, to sell. Yeah. And just, to, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand really uh, the business aspect of it and the metrics and you know, really kind of keeping track and how to evaluate. I would, my goal was to, to get the food out on consignment and get it off the truck. I didn't want to, I didn't want to take food home at the, at the end of the day. Um, but, but then I, I realized as I went, um, you know, that there was a, you know, you had to have skill, you had to have technique, you had to have process. 
Um, you know, how do you develop repeat business? And then, you know, uh, the time of year, the time of month, what area you were in based upon what time of month, the first and the 15th, you know, all those types of deals, you know, so it was, uh, and, you know, I kind of traveled around. I would go as far as Buffalo. I went to Erie, you know, at the Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. I would go, uh, you know, I, we, I would connect with some some other guys that across the country that were doing it. I would, I went down to Daytona uh, Beach uh, one weekend and, and sold, you know, so, Lord. yeah. So, you, you know, always leading somewhere with this. Is there anything you learned on that job that is translated to being the head coach of a major program? Oh yeah, I mean it, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I learned. A, I learned a lot. I mean, for me, um, like when, once I once I started coaching and in, in like in college, and I and I saw uh, the recruiting from the other side of it, not just as a player, but from from a coaching uh, side. I said, you got to be kidding me. We, you know, this is not door to door, door, door to door. We, you know, we, we have marketing, like we have facilities to sell. We have coaching staff to sell. We have a stadium to sell. I mean, we, we have all these things. We have brochures. We have, uh, we have all, I mean, it was, it was a crowd. I said, we have all of these tools. Like this, this is not that hard guys. Like to get, to get players compared to knocking on doors. That's kind of how I thought about it in, like in my mind. And so uh, it's really, it really helped me in recruiting, you know, how to handle objections, you know, how to meet people where they are, you know, mirroring and things like that, um, that I learned, um, you know, just pretty much going, going door to door and, uh, and, uh, and the diversity, uh, the, the, the types of homes that I would, uh, that you know the doors I would knock on. I I would do businesses, small businesses. Mm-hmm. I would be I would go out in the country, mm-hmm. and I would be in the projects and anywhere in between. You know, it'd be a half million dollar home, million dollar home, and and then I would be, you know, maybe you know I would you know Lorristown. I would hit a trailer park. You know, yeah. so it was. Uh, you, you learn how to to relate to Everyone. all types of people, and yeah. you never judge a book by its cover. Ain't, ain't that the truth? It, it's amazing how you can even find the positivity in, in what wasn't the, the highlight of your life. Cause yeah. people are not going to remember you for that. They're going to remember sure. for the, for the programs that uh, you've built. So um, before we get to our mid roll break, I, I do have to hit this one. Uh, usually, you know, we want to keep family out of it, but yeah. so, you know, as we were reading about you, you met your wife or well, you, you talked to her for a little bit, met her on a blind date. Yep. And you proposed on the blind date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true. I mean, I'm a you know I'm a guy. Um, you know, I believe in you know uh, quick decisions, uh, quick implementation, and quick execution. And if you're going down the wrong path, then change direction, and 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 then you know and start and start up again. And so, and I was actually more so like that when I was younger than than I actually am now. But I, I still still believe in that. You know, uh, you know, go. You know. What, what information do you have? Uh, and then, uh, you know, make a decision and go with it. it well, it worked out. Sure did. I, it worked out, and you yeah. got a beautiful family now. Um, so let's get to the mid-roll break, and we, we ask our guests, because, again, this whole podcast is about learning, learning from high performers like yourself uh, and how we can apply that to our lo- own, own lives. But we also learn from failure. I, I'm a yeah. believer that the most learning comes from failure. Yeah. It's, it's actually the greatest mentor mm-hmm. if you can learn to embrace it and learn to move on. So biggest regret of your life? Uh, biggest regret of my life, I would say probably uh, when I decided uh, to uh, in the ninth grade not to play baseball. I actually started uh, the, the, like the preseason you know, training with the team, um, and then um, I decided that you know, I just wanted to focus on football and basketball, but um, – it was something that I started and I didn't finish. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I look back on it. I've, I've, I, I've never really done that. Um, and, um, you know, the game of baseball was a, a big part of my life since, you know, <laughs> since, you know, I can, I can remember. And, um, and uh, it, it, it really would have, would have helped me. Um, not that I wanted to go to college and be a, a baseball player, but, you know, my dad would always tell me baseball is seventy five percent mental and twenty five percent physical. You know, he would always tell me that it's a thinking man's game. You know, yes. And so uh, that's a that's an aspect of uh, kind of really of my development that I think I kind of missed out on. 
why, why did you eliminate baseball, not basketball? Well, it's a lot more fun to uh, to play basketball in open gym and things like that. I suppose that much more uh, active. Yeah, sport, it, yeah, yeah. It was much more active, and and um, and uh, you know, it, it, basketball at my high school was very very competitive, and so was football. But basketball was very you you know you had to make the team. You know, everyone that went out for the for basketball didn't make the team at, at mm-hmm. my high school, and, mm-hmm. and and you know I. You know, in, in my neighborhood in Cleveland Heights, University Heights, you know, to, to be on the Heights High basketball team was a big deal. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so every open gym that you could, that you could be a part of and, and, and um, you know, you, you almost kind of had to be there all the time to even have a chance uh, to be on the squad. And I didn't really want to, to miss that opportunity. But looking back on it now, um, you know, I, I could I could have – Done all three. Hardest decision you've ever had to make in your life? Ooh, the hardest decision I've ever had to make, um, I would say it was uh, leaving leaving uh, Colorado after one season. That was that was a tough. I would, that was it was anguish, uh, you know, on my on my part, um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. I well. I can see that being a very, very tough decision. Let me, let me ask you this, not, not yeah. to dive into yeah, that. Sure. Was, was, was that a singular decision, or did you involve the family in that decision? Oh, uh, the family was involved, obviously, uh, you know, um, especially, my, especially the, the boys. I mean, we've never been anywhere more than four, four years, yeah. and I think my son has been to, you know, three or four high schools, and he just graduated, you know, last, last weekend. Um, Congrats! Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. The time the time goes so fast. I mean, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. But yeah, it was. Uh, there, there were lots of, of um, people that I really trust that, that care that care about me that that were involved. Like really helped me. You know, um, you know, sort through it. Um, but uh, it was just it's it's just it's just really tough because you know I actually recruited uh, two classes. Of, of guys, when, even though I was there for only one season, but there was two. I had two classes on, under my belt there, um, and uh, you know I'm a, I'm a I'm a people I'm a people guy, and so I would that I was that was really and I had some I had, a, I, had I had a lot of friendships, yeah. uh, close friendships I had I had developed uh, you know uh, you know outside of the team outside of the program, um, and um, you know we. I felt like we were we were moving we were moving in the right direction, you yeah. know. So um, that was that was that was that was that was really tough, um, you know, for for me. Yep. Well, I mean, that's why you're paid to do what you do to make the hard decisions. But sure. it, if they're your true friends, then they're they're still there, and I'm sure. They oh, are. and they are, yeah. and they are, and, uh, and 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 I and I I realize that, um, you know, now. But you know, when you know when when uh, sometimes when you're in the moment. Um, sometimes you, you can't, you can't see some of those things. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, it's, it's always tough. I've never, um, uh, I mean, I remember leaving, uh, LSU to go to Ohio state, yeah. I, um, coach Saban, you know, I was there, I was there with him and he was my mentor and, you know, I was going back, you know, pretty much back home, you know, two and a half hours from, from my parents and. Things like that, and and that was, I mean, that was a that was a tough decision. You know, it was it was, I mean, those are those decisions are, um, you know, are are not easy. Um, but you know, again, um, you know, I I, have to, I take ownership. Those yeah. decisions that I ultimately ultimately made, and and that, that I have to live with, and I have to make them work. Well, Mel, that brings us to our mid roll break, and we will be right back. And we are back with Mel Tucker. Head football coach of Michigan State University. Uh, so, again, last season, we, as we said, 11-2 and two record. You came on in 2020. Unfortunately, COVID hit, and you guys had a short season. Sure. Um, but, you know, I want to focus the last half of this podcast, because this is so applicable to anyone, to a father or a mother, a business leader, a department leader, a military leader, and it is funny, it, it, like, so you talk to a lot of business leaders and you talk to a lot of military leaders and we all, it's like we automatically default to like 
head football coaches. I mean, the, the, the Vince Lombardis, the Nick Sabins, the Bill Echecks, the, the, the Mel Tuckers, you guys sort of set a bar for leadership and culture, and that's why I want to focus on that. But you stepped in, and when, when somebody's hired as a head coach, it's usually because one of two things. One, the, the coach just sort of timed out. He, he wants to retire. Or the program is not where it needs to be. Sure. Yep. I mean, you've got, you've got a time horizon. There's no, and we talked about this off, off camera, like you can't come in, come in and say, I, I've got a five-year plan and this is, <laughs> this is what it is. No. It, because you said you'd get booed out of the, uh, yeah. the press conference. Yeah, you, 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 you can't do that. The, the days of the, the five-year plan, I think, are over. I really do at, at the Power Five level, certainly. Is college football a little more brutal than the NFL, where maybe the owner will give – that time horizon to, to a coach he loves rather than, and this is my personal opinion. I'm not asking you to, 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 to reinforce it. Sometimes it seems like the boosters and the alumni at certain universities can be just brutal. They expect immediate results. Well, I think I really believe that it depends on uh, the place. I mean, every place is a little, is a little yeah. different, you know? Um, and uh, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, there might be an owner, or an AD or a president that would love to stick with you, that want mm-hmm. that believes in you and wants to stick stick with you, but the popular, the 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 you know the masses just won't allow it. You know, what I mean, it's, and and uh, and I've I've seen that, you know, I've I've seen that um, where uh, a head coach is 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 cut loose and uh, not because uh, the owner or the the AD or the, or the pre- president wanted to do it, it's because they felt like they had to do it. You know, and so, um, yeah. But certainly, the the the, the time horizon is, uh, you know, it's a it's a. I think it's a short it's a shorter run, runway than it used to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, you see, you, I think you see a little bit, a, a few more one and dones in the NFL than you than you see in, in uh, at the at the college level. Um, you know, but uh, you know, you know, either way, um, you know, th- there there needs to be a sense of urgency. To get the program moving in the right direction, you have to show improvement. You know, that's that's the one thing, um, and uh, you know people need to be able to see it. Uh, you just can't talk about it. People need to be able to to actually see it with their own eyes and say this is this is moving in the right direction. This is better. Recruiting is better. You know the brand of football on the field is better. You know the 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 you know the language that we're hearing. Uh, you know, coming out of the building with the players and the coaches is uh, is resonating. There's some there's some alignment uh, here. You know, we 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 like what we're seeing. It, that that you know that has to happen. And uh, you know, but it, it really it's uh it's it's, it's really for me. Um, it's not so much about the external expectations. Yes. It's a I have an internal clock. You know, there's a you know I have a. a I have expectations uh, for myself as a, as a, you know, personally, and then you know, as a, as a, as a football coach, and you know, for the program, this is where, um, this is, you know, I have to evaluate where, where do I think our, you know, where do I think our potential is, like, you know, you know, uh, you know, what, what is our ceiling, you know, and, uh, and then how fast, how quickly do I think that we can reach our full potential. Um, and then and maintain that and, and be consistent uh, and compete at the highest level, you know, year in and year out. And so, personally, I don't believe in self-imposed limitations. I just can't. I, I just can't deal with that. And so, um, I'm all. You know, it's always, you know, why not me? You know, why not? Why not us? And uh, I'm not going to put any limitations on on uh, on myself or on, on our program. And so. Uh, with the, with that with that mindset and that thought process, um, then you know the sky's the limit. You know, uh, being the best is attainable. So so at that point, it's it's it's, it's game on. You know, every day, like how how we're going how we're going to get there, uh, how long is it going to take, um, and uh, and you literally uh, literally have to have to get uh, better in in some aspect. You know, every single day, it's the aggregation of marginal gains. You know, getting getting a little bit better. Everybody getting a little bit better, 
every single day. One step at a time is, is what we time. love to, uh, to say. And, and that's the whole mantra of the everyday warrior. It's just every day is a battle. Yep. Just get 1% better. It does not mean every single day is a step forward. That's right. Some days two steps back, but that's, that's, right. that's life. It, if all your personal friends who knew you extremely well were sitting in the audience right now, would they say, yeah, Mel holds himself to an extremely high bar? I would, I would think so. I would think the people that, that know me the best um, would say that, uh, that uh, they probably worry about me a little bit. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> they, would they say you, you take it sometimes yeah, too yeah, far? Yeah, but, yeah, they, okay. yeah. I, I get that quite a bit. You know, you need to you need to get you know you need make sure you get some sleep. Make sure you take a little time for yourself. Make sure you you know keep it in perspective. You know, there's a process. It's, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know that type of deal. And, and and I really appreciate that. You know, because people care about you. They love you. You know, they, you can't see your own eyebrows. You know, so they they kind of see some things that I can't see. But um, you know, at the at the same time, um, you know. Um, I know what I know. <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know. That's right. So let, me, let me ask you this. Because I've, I've noticed, and I'd be interested in your answer, I've noticed this amongst very high performers that hold themselves to sometimes what seems like a, a overly high bar. Mm. Do you take time to celebrate, celebrate victories personally? Uh, I, I do. Um, uh, it's... Uh, but sometimes the victories aren't like the obvious victory. Sometimes I, I know it may it may not be obvious to to, to someone you know like obvious on like outside beating Michigan in. two state two years in a row. Yeah, I mean that that I mean sorry, I mean that's a that's a big game for us. That's our that's our that's our biggest game. That's my biggest game. I mean that's that's the most important game. That's, that's a national rivalry. I mean yeah. almost like yeah, a, I mean a lot that, of America tunes in for that that one. Yeah, I mean I, I lean into that that, that uh, I mean. Uh, I said that from day one. I mean, that's a game that that's a game that we need to win, you know. Um, but then it's you know, you know, very quickly after that game, it's like okay, now uh, you know what's next, and, on. and you have you, you have to move on quickly. Um, but you know, I do believe in celebrating uh, victories. I, I believe in celebrating the small victories. You know, <laughs> some of the some some of the victories that may seem small and insignificant uh, to uh, someone on the outside, you know. I know personally that you know it was, this was big. Just to be able to get this done, you know, be able to, to make this higher or be able to to you know acquire this resource is a uh, you know is a uh, is huge because you know how much you put into it and you know how hard it is to get to get it done. And uh, and I, I do believe in, in celebrating uh, those things. Uh, I mean that's the that's the that's a great that's a great part about it. I mean you do get a chance to. You know, to celebrate and then kind of, you know, reevaluate and say, okay, now, you know, what's next? I know you're big on leadership and culture, especially culture, yep. and, and that you're trying to build a, a an organization of cultural warriors, which, yep. which we talked about today. You step into a program like Michigan State, mm -hmm. which is a massive program, and you're expected to turn it around. When it pertains to culture, where the hell do you start on that one? Huh. I really start. I really start with the with the staff, with the people. You know, the culture is is how you live and behave every every single day, and uh, and those behaviors create outcomes, and and those actions create outcomes, and 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 that's those are people, you know. And you win you win with people, you really do. And so it starts with the with the coaching staff, and the the support staff, the analysts, the the quality control, the GAs, the strength and conditioning coaches. You know, nutrition. You know, uh, player player engagement, uh, operations. Uh, I, I I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, you know. And but I, I but I need I need folks with me that uh, that have that we we have alignment on like kind of how we see the game of football, how we see organizations, how we see culture, how we see accountability, how we see urgency, how we see detail. Um, and I'm very very fortunate. Um, I'm surrounded by a, a, a great uh, bunch of men and women um, who uh, who see culture and, and, and organizations and and and, and kind of you know w winning uh, this this the same way as me. Even though we we're, we're very diverse and we have different skill sets and we 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 leverage each other's uh, you know uh, skill sets and abilities um, you know for the for the team. Um, 
we're different, but we're we're the same. I, I I always ask this question: Is is he one of us? Is she one of us? You know. People talk about alignment quite a lot. In fact, we were talking about it in the car today. Does alignment necessarily necessarily mean agreement? No, no. I mean, so at the end of the day, <clears throat> I have to make a decision. And once the decision is made, then when we leave that room, Amen. we all got to be on the same Amen. page. And, and, that, and that's, that's non-negotiable. You know, but, you know, a, a, agreement, um, you know, there's going to be agreement, there's going to be disagreement, there's going to be debate, you know, it's going to be healthy, it's, it's, it's needed. You know, I, I, if, 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 I'm, if, if, if there's not debate, if there's not difference of, differences of opinion, and I'm talking about like strong passion, yes. something, something's wrong. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not paying attention. You know, maybe we don't care enough, you know, and so, uh, or I don't have enough diversity on the staff. I don't have, I don't, I don't have, I don't need, I don't need, you know, 10 of me. I need guys, I need people that can, that can, uh, you know, maybe be strong where I'm not as strong, you know, and we can think think differently and and bring some different ideas to the table. You know, you always got to have that, you always got to have that person or that, uh, that person in the room that's. That, you you know that person. You always gotta have that person in the room. This this uh, not that negative, but it's gonna shoot everything down all the time. Try to you know the devil's advocate there person. There you know go. you gotta yeah, yeah, you gotta yeah. have that person. We and, call that uh, red selling. In, in, uh, yeah. in, in the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so within your culture, you you sort of demand that. Yeah, but to a point. Yeah, I promote it. I mean, I I, I want that. I, I ask for it. I mean, it's necessary um, because. Uh, you know, I, I don't. How can you have a great organization? How can you have great culture when you don't when you don't have that? When you don't have people that that uh, that love each other enough to trust each other enough to 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 feel like they can't where they can't speak up. You know, I mean that's that's a if I if 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 people in our organization don't feel like they can speak up, then I'm a poor leader, and I and I, that's something that. Uh, that, I, that I'm mindful of, and, and sometimes I've got some guys on my staff, you know, and, uh, that say, hey, coach, I mean, you, you, I think you need to take a look at this. Or, uh, you know, some, some of the guys are wondering about this, or some of the guys are wondering about that, or, you know, I, I'll have consultants come in from the outside and evaluate and, and do surveys and do one-on-ones with folks and give me a, you know, give me a Give a report, you know. Give me a you know three or four page report, and some sometimes I don't like what I what I see there, but it is what it is, you know. Now now what am I going to do about it? And so, uh, but it's all about becoming the best and you know maximizing our potential and uh, and and you know making sure that that uh, that you know we're doing the right things on a, on a day to day basis to get to where we want to go. It's amazing the third party perspective that's not emotionally. Yep involved in the organization to yeah. give just a very fair sort of yeah. a, a subjective viewpoint. Yeah. But I mean, we, we say, and I know we talked about this earlier today, you know, in the military, we have something called a senior enlisted advisor if I'm an officer. Yeah. And usually we, we consider it the wise old man. And, and what's key to that is tell me what I need to hear, not what I want that's right. to hear. And that's some hard, sometimes hard. So Mel, I, I have no doubt there is strong alignment amongst the coaching staff and the supporting staff. And yeah. I mean, you're also dealing with 30, 40, 50 year olds, yeah. but for a young 18 to 23 year old right. who, if I'm remembering back to my days, uh, I knew freaking everything. <laughs> how, how does, how do you shape that part of the culture? How do you get them to, to, to buy in? How do you, how do you get them to trust you? Cause I remember yeah. when I was, I wouldn't say I didn't trust my dad yeah. when I was 16, but there was, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want to listen to him. Sure. How do you get these these young studs, and they're all studs, yeah. to to buy into what you're selling? It's 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 more difficult when you come when you when you come in initially, and the guys that you're coaching are not guys that trust you. Not they don't know you. You didn't recruit them. You used, you know it's easier when you're recruiting guys because people are attracted to you. You're recruiting guys because they like they want to be a part of the culture. That there is a line. That's why they that's why they want to come. Um, but you know how do you do that? Uh, you 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 uh, you know you said it. It's, it's trust. You know, and it starts with you know we have to communicate. I have to communicate to the players that you know I see you as a person. 
I see yeah. you as a human being. I see you as an individual. Football is what you do. It's not who you are. And I'm here for you. I want you to win in life, that period. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be here, okay? So let, let me help you get, you know, what you want out of this deal. And then uh, once we communicate that, then, we, then, then myself and, and our staff, we have to demonstrate that every day. It's all about, you know, connection, you know, uh, authentic relationships, one, you know, one, you know, one on one, you know, time and inv- time invested with with young men, uh, not just in the meeting room, not just on the field, but, you know, off the field. And uh, and it's uh, it's not it's not always easy. And you mentioned listening. Um, you should be, be surprised at what you yeah. can learn if you if, yeah. you if you could just listen to what these guys are saying because sometimes you know sometimes uh, they they're right in some of the stuff that they're saying you know and so uh, but but that's that's how we that's how you they know you're gonna listen to them they know you care yeah um, and then you will they know that you're willing to invest in them and and I tell them hey when you do good I do good when you do bad I do bad so we're actually in the same boat. I think our brain is hardwired to see this hierarchy. Yeah. Where if I'm a coach, if I'm a, a boss, I'm I'm mainly speaking at the person. Sure. And it's not a two way conversation. Right. Um, wait, let me go to this because I know in your office, and and every boss says I have an open door policy, but I'd say about ninety percent of them are full of you know what. Because <laughs> um, if you do come in, they're usually like, "Get out! I'm busy." You've got some jars full of, uh, you know, treats, snacks. What what is the purpose behind those jars to sit in your office? Yeah, I mean, I, I want I want I want the guys and and staff as well. And sometimes the staff they come in and grab the grab the snacks and candy more than the players. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I want I want I want the players to, to to not to know without a shadow of a doubt that they can come into my office anytime for anything. And it's it's a it's an environment that's safe for them. Um, it's it's a uh, it's comfortable for them. Um, it's 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 all it's like a family deal. And it's uh, and you know I'm I'm not their I'm not I'm not their dad. You know I'm I'm not a parent, but I'm a, as close to that as you can get. And uh, when 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 a when a young man can come into my office. Um, you know whether he's got an appointment or he's or unannounced, impromptu, and you know and sit down, you know, and, and really kind of exhale, and and you know have a conversation. It could you know it could be uh, it could be something that's really kind of just you know shooting the bull, or it could be something that could be really you know it could be a really tough deal. Um, they can do that, and 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 know that I'm not going to judge them. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna judge them. You know, um, empathy. Yeah, True and empathy. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I was once in their shoes, and I mean, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done half of the stupid stuff that I did back in the day. But I mean, uh, I mean, they 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 need to have, they need to have, the head coach in their corner. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. important. It's important for them to know, and and you don't. Um, it's not about it's not about being buddy buddy with the guys. That's not that's that's not it at all. You know, I'm a I'm a player's coach. I consider myself a player's coach, but I'm a strict disciplinarian at the same time. You know, but is is it a disciplinarian or is it just simply holding people accountable? It, I mean, it's holding people accountable, and, and discipline is doing what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, the way you're supposed to do it, and no, and understand why it's important to, important to get it done a certain way. You know that's my def- that's our definition of, of discipline, and so, but it, it's 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 love and discipline. You know, you have if you have love and discipline, and it's authentic, then you can pretty much get anything done with any guy. But th- it's it's not easy. It take it takes time. You know, and and it's a it's it's work. You got to care. You 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 use a word that I don't think is used enough. Love. I you know when I speak to organizations about the military when they have preconceived, no, preconceived notions. They think it's just all discipline and accountability. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we actually, you know, if you want to know how we lead in the military, we lead through love. And the highest form of compassion is accountability. Right. If your kids do something, 
As a parent, what do you do? You hold them accountable. That's right. Not from a, a standpoint of just punishment, right. but teaching them right. in order to become competent, good human beings that contribute to society or That's whatever right. team they're a part of. That's right. I, I agree. I mean, punishment is is uh, you know that, that's a that's a tricky thing because um, you know you have to change the behavior, it, it, and if you're not changing the behavior, then you're not effective. No. As a coach, you know, if you're trying to correct something, you, you know, just, you know, punishment, whatever that form of punishment is, you know, if it's not changing the behavior, then 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 you're not coaching, you know. So it's uh, it's it, you, it's more so, um, you know, we have to come, we have to you have to teach, you know, coaching is teaching. And if you can if you can teach, a player can learn. So how do you meet this player where he is, you know, the delivery of the information. Um, sometimes you got to take a couple runs at a guy. You know, it does, sometimes it doesn't work the first, second, third, or fourth time. You know, tell him, tell him what you told him, tell him a thousand times, but sometimes you got to tell him a different way. And, uh, and, and if you can do that and build the trust and keep coming at guys and, and just have empathy and, 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 they, and they, they know that you love them because of the time that you spend with them. They, they know that because, you know, uh, you know, there's only so much time in a day. I have an hourglass in my office, and sometimes I take the hourglass and I no kidding. I turn it up and I, I say, "Hey, listen, this 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 sand is going this way. It ain't going that way. We can't get this time back. Okay, my time is. We got the same amount of time in a day. I got 24 hours. You got 24 hours. We got the same amount of time, and I'm investing my time in you right now. You have a title that." Military leaders, business leaders, government leaders are all trying to attain. Coach, is it lost in you how, I mean, just how precious that title is? I'll tell you what, I, I uh, you know, I've always had reverence for my coaches. Um, my dad was my first coach. He's my little yeah. league baseball coach. And, uh, and uh, I mean, my my coach, I don't know where I would be if it weren't for my my teachers, you know, in in uh, in school. And but you know, my coaches, I I I don't I don't know where I would be. I mean, um, because coaches see you when you're at your worst. <laughs> they see you. They see you. You know, they see you when you're most vulnerable. When well, you're yeah. most vulnerable. When you're tired. When you're when you're hurt. You know, when you when you don't have confidence, you know, they they see you when your girlfriend broke up with you, but you still gotta go to practice and all that type of yeah. they see you when you got beat for a touchdown. I mean, they see they see you in the locker room after you know, after a loss. Or, you know, I mean the coaches see it all. Um, but uh we love them all the way through it. Yeah. You know, and that and so that's that's the importance of coaching and uh and you know, a a, co- a coach can a, a coach that um can can hurt a guy. You know, that's a, the power. Yeah, the, a coach, a coach can hurt a guy, and that's and that's something that uh, that uh, you you always have to remember. I always have to remember and keep in mind that uh, again, I see you as a person. Okay, uh, my son, I got a son that's eighteen years old. I got a son that's twenty years old. Like, okay, this is my son here. Okay, accountability, yes. You know, confronting demand, yes. You know, discipline, yes. Okay, but you know. How am I gonna? How am I gonna help you? Never want to leave leave them bleeding in the street, man. Yeah, I, I know you. So, roughly, how many people do you usually have on a uh, uh, on, the, the, on the roster? On the roster, we're about one hundred and twenty players. Yeah, about eighty five guys on scholarship, and the, the balance of those guys walk. In, in a, a good year, fifteen may make it into the NFL. That would be a phenomenal year. phenomenal year. Yeah. So most will will go on to enter into the private sector, graduate college, and have to yep. go find a job. Yep. To, to what degree do you, do you feel you're, you're prepping these young men for uh, life, or what, what role can a, a coach truly play in that? Well, I mean, again, if, if, if they hear from, from me and they hear from our coaches, you know, like, hey, I, I see you as a person. Football is, is what you do. It's not who you are. Yeah. Um, and we have real conversations with guys about, hey, you know, life beyond football – you know, yeah. what do you want to do? Where are you at? Where do you see yourself? Like, how, how can we help you get there? You know, what are you doing every day, you know, to get uh, towards that goal? Um, when they know it's important to us, um, then it becomes, it, it becomes even more important to them. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we work really hard to, to, 
to help our guys develop off the field. Career development is a big part of uh, you know what we're uh, what we're passionate about, um, and and uh, we're not where we where we want to where we want to be, but we're working uh, hard on it. We have people that are dedicated, you know, to that in our program in our organization. We have curriculum that we teach in house that's been developed in house, where we pour into our guys from the day uh, that they get here. Um, to to be, I tell you what, because uh, this is a tough. It's a tough place to be. It's a tough place to be when you're in a position where you're no longer on a team. You're no longer playing, and you've never been in that situation. You haven't been in that situation your entire life, and you don't know what you're going to do. And your entire identity, self worth, and it like everything your your. Ego, everything is tied up in being a, 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 a ball player, and now you don't have ball. Where are you? That is that ain't that's a tough spot to be in. Coach, coach I'm, I'm I'm only laughing because you just described what it's like to be a, a career special operations guy or a career military guy. Wow. That's you had a tribe. That's all you knew for your adult wow. life, and then all of a sudden, unfortunately, you're now forty or forty five, <laughs> getting out, and you lose that that tribe, and you lose that mm. it, which. It becomes being a ball player from high school and having the ability to, to compete at Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. It doesn't matter. Yep. It becomes part of your DNA. It, it is. I mean, it's a lot of these kids, I ask them in recruiting, like, when do you start playing ball? Some of these guys started playing organized football when they were five years old. Yeah. You know, that's all That's all they know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, prescribed time. You know, this is when you practice. This is when you lift. This is when you do this. This is when you go to class. I mean, you do all these things. And, and then when they, they don't have that um, – and and then some of some of the uh, relationships uh, disappear when the game disappears too, which is which is tough for guys. And so um, I think it's critically important uh, that our that our guys um, are developed um, to a point where they're going to play as long as they can, play as long as you can. But they know without a shadow of a doubt, when my playing days are over, there there I have I have. Excellent opportunities. They have the fundamentals to succeed and in I, life, no matter what. Yeah, the fundamentals to succeed, and I'm I'm ready for whatever. And that and that's and that's 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 our job. We've got to get that done for these kids. I, I want to get to questions from the audience, but you know, as I'm taking notes and I'm learning, uh, this is what I foresee. Not not to you know forecast your death, but <laughs> here lies Mel Tucker, and on the tombstone it says, "Live life." relentlessly and with a sense of urgency. You keep saying relentless, and I know that's become sort of the mantra for, for Spartan football. What is, what is it about relentless and urgency? I mean, what, what are your definitions of those, and why, why do you keep – I mean, it sounds like it, it's part of your fabric. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, – I think it just comes from, you know, getting knocked down so many times and, and then having to get back up that you understand that if you're going to make it, in this world, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to if you're going to finish first, you're going to stand at the top. Um, you have to be relentless. You have to be high velocity. You have to be nonstop, and it's never going to end. I mean, it's never you're never there. It's never going to end. Uh, it's the it's you know my my goal uh, when I started coaching, my mindset was I want to get done in one year what it would take a normal person three years to do, and so that's how I worked, and and um, and so that's that's urgency. You know that's uh, you know that's attention to detail. That's efficiency. That's that's finding a better way. You know, um, you know, sleep fast. You know, uh, hit the ground running. You know, type deal. And then, um, you know, never never quitting. You know, uh, never giving up. Keep clawing. Keep fighting. You know, keep keep you know keep find, keep finding a way. Um, and uh, and and really, there's no opportunity for complacency or anything like that because you're never there. There are no truer words even when you're number one and you're standing on top of the mountain. That, that doesn't stop. And we've seen prize fighters. Yeah. I, I love boxing in the sense that the prize fighters, when they get to number one, yeah. with the exception of a few guys, sure. uh, like, you know, Mayweather, he's proven. Right, like, he's right. got it. But we've seen the greats like Tyson just, mm -hmm. they change the way they, they train. Right. Life is also different because they have a whole lot of money. Yep. Everyone's coming at them for something, yep. and, and, and they, they fall from the top. Yep, uh, it, it's it's really tough. My dad used to was always he always tells me he tells me this now. He said you got to go back and you got to tell yourself your life story. You got to go back. You got to go, and I constantly go back. He says go all the way back to you know 
uh, 10510 Park Lane, Park Lane Drive, apartment 108. Start there and no and, and, and take it all the way. And In fact, you still remember that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right there, apartment 108, and take it all the way. You know, up into the to the current moment. Um, and if that doesn't, if that doesn't, um, if that doesn't motivate you, then nothing will. That's that's powerful. We always remember where you came from. That's right. In, in the journey. Well, I want to open it up to any questions from the, uh, the audience. Coach, you, you talked a little bit about your, your timeline when you got here and, and developing the program. And I think it's kind of interesting. A lot of uh, teams, pro and college, are begging their fan bases for patience. Uh, this was sort of the reverse. Your fan base was preaching patience to you and you were telling them to kind of leave it alone. In your head, did you even as ambitious as you are, see an 11-win season in what is really your first year. I know you downplay that, but that was your first year. I was ready for the parade at 7-5 and five if we got there. You had 11 wins. Did even you think that was possible? Yeah, I mean, our, our goal, um, to, you know, every year is to win every game on the schedule. Um, you know, you got to play the games. And, and, uh, and you know, we, we actually had T-shirts made for our players – um, after our second scrimmage um, in preseason camp, they said they had destination on the front and they had the, the GPS coordinates of Indianapolis on the back. This is before we, we even played a game. I mean, that's, we believe that, um, you know, inside our building that we were capable of, of uh, you know, of having that type of success if we – did what we were capable of doing if we were able to stay healthy, if we were able to continue to get better and continue to grow uh, as a team. And so, um, you know, we we weren't surprised, um, but at the same time, like we we never we don't take it for granted. We we know, you know what it what it took to be able to to get there, and then we know, um, you know, how much distance there is between where we were and then you know where we need to go. And so, uh, you know, we, it's, we're just very realistic uh, about it. But you know, we, um, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't like to talk about it. You know, so much. Um, we 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 talk about the process and about the work, and you know, and then and then we the actions we have to we have to do it. It's day to day. It's the the journey along the way. But again, I don't believe in self imposed limitations. You know, and I'm not going to let anyone put a limitation on me. And I'm, I'm for sure not going to put a limitation on our on our on our players and on our program. I mean, let's 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 get what we can get. Coach, you're you're very intentional about your culture and how you work to build that at at MSU. And it, it is not just head coach and players. There are a lot of different people from your coaching staff to your players to the admin staff to the operational staff, the support staff that touch your program and affect culture. What would you say are one of the top one or two behaviors that are non-negotiables for the culture that you're trying to establish? And additionally, how do you go about aligning that behavior from you at the top all the way through your organization to make sure that remains a non-negotiable in your culture? That's like a graduate level question right there. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's not is an undergrad a, student. I got a public school education on the east side of Cleveland, man, but... No, but uh, yeah. So um, uh, one of the non-negotiables is is uh, is uh, negativity, you know, uh, especially uh, verbal, you know, negativity language. Um, we don't preach being positive. That's not something that we we we're not into that. Um, I'm actually a, against unearned positivity. You know, you you know you're you know you're down sixteen, you know against the school down the road at halftime. I mean, like, what's positive about that? It's not, okay, guys, it's okay, right, right, no. It, I mean, what do we need to do, right? What, what, what's the next right step? Um, but, but negativity, uh, and, so, and we know positivity does not work all the time, especially when it's unearned. But we know negativity has a negative effect 100% of the time. You know, negative thoughts, you know, are very powerful. Uh, verbalizing a negative thought is seven to 10 times more powerful than just thinking it because uh, just thinking something, think, just have a negative thoughts affects you negatively. But, uh, but when you verbalize it, it only, it not only affects you, but it, it, it affects people 
around you who hear that. So um, something that's non-negotiable negotiable in our program is uh, is uh, we we tell guys don't say dumb things out loud. It, it, it just don't don't let me hear it. It, it. it just keep it to yourself. And and that's one thing. The other thing is is uh you know we're a confront and demand organization. What basically means you know we have standards. Uh, the standards are the standards. And uh, if 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 we're not behaving, performing at a standard, whatever it is, then um, it, we have to confront that immediately, right there on the spot. You we do not wait. You can't wait later on in the day or after practice or after the game or you know see if it's going to get better. You know that that's not acceptable. You gotta you have to address it right then and. and Confronting it, it, it may not necessarily be, you know, uh, you know, uh, like a like ripping uh, ripping someone or or you know, something like that. But you, you have to address it. You know, you have to address it, and, and you have to see it. If a guy's shirt's not tucked in in practice, you, well, hey, you gotta you gotta address it right then. Hey, tuck your shirt in. You know, that's that's non negotiable. If, if the guys, if we don't jog, we don't walk on the field. If a guy's walking off the field, you know, then you know, if if I see that, I gotta confront that. If a team, if a coach sees it, he's got to confront it. If a teammate sees it, he needs to confront it, and that's never going to change, you know. Because if you don't, if you don't, ha if, if if that's the, if those are the standards, and we don't live up to those standards, then we don't, then our culture is not strong, and we don't have a program. And when things start to slide, they slide in inches. They slide in inches, you know, right before your eyes, you know. And uh, that's where all the the, the attention to detail, the the little things are big things, you know, because it's, it's in the margins right there where um, you separate, you know, really, um, you know, the, the winners from the losers. Hey Coach, you've mentioned uh, recruiting a number of times during this podcast. We all know that recruiting is very important in the military, in football, but also in the business world. What characteristics do you look for when recruiting an individual, not just a football player, but also your staff. Yeah, so we we have a um, you know we we really have kind of two you know really grades for for guys, um, and uh, you know at 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 this level, you know where we're recruiting, they're all you know everyone that we're recruiting, um, they're, they're all good players, you know, and so you know there's height, weight, speed, you know, change of direction, you know. Uh, uh, leaping ability, you know, ball skills, you know, all those are balance and body control, power. Those are things that you can see on tape. Those are things you can see, you know, with your eyes. I mean, that, you know, you can evaluate that. Um, and that's one score. And, and obviously, to compete at the highest level, we, we've got to have guys that are big, fast, and strong and can, and can, and can move and can do all those things. Um, but the, the, other, the other part of it is, uh, which is just as important, is what we call a fit score. The fit, the, a fit score is like the intangibles, you know, things that you can't necessarily necessarily see on tape. Where you have to do some digging. You got to ask. If you ask specific questions, you get a specific answer. You know, uh, what type of leader is he? How does he handle harsh criticism? You know, uh, how does uh, what is his pain tolerance? You know, uh, what is how coachable is this guy? Coachable. You know, how does he learn? You know, these are all things you, 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 need, to, uh, you need to know about, uh, about a guy. Uh, is, is he a good teammate? Um, and so if you have a high, basically, you know, a athletic score and you have a high fit score, you know, then, then we're cooking with gas. I mean, that's the, that's the guy. That's the guy we, we, we want. If you got a high athletic score and a low, and a low fit score, you are not for us. You're, you're, you're just not. You know, and obviously, if you but you have a high fit score, and you know, a low, you know, on the on the measurables, then you're not for us either because because um, you know we because at this level we need both, and so uh, those are the things that we're looking for in, in, in players, and we and we have we have to ca cast a broad net. Uh, we recruit coast to coast. Um, we're very aggressive in our offers, and and you know again. A quick evaluation, you know, you got to find the guys, you got to evaluate them, 
And then you got to get the offers out. Then you got to start recruiting. You know, you got to start you start marketing, start recruiting. You know, get them on campus, and uh, and, and you know, build the relationships, and and then you know, and then compete for them. And, and because uh, in recruiting, uh, you know, the, we're in competition for players. You know, we're not we're not recruiting in a vacuum. And competition and recruiting is is is, is in large part about comparison. They're comparing our program to the other, you know, 5, 10, 15 programs that they're seriously considering. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the lifeblood of our organization, extremely important. One last question. Hey, Coach, I appreciate you taking questions. So it, it's obvious that player engagement is such a priority for, for you and your program. I want to shift your attention away from football a little bit and ask you, you know, we're seeing in the industry that employee engagement is just not happening. How would you recommend that leaders at, you know, the supervisor, the manager, the general level manager, how would you, what advice would you give them when it comes to engaging with their employees? Yeah, it's, uh, you have to be intentional. You have to first ask yourself, is it important for, for, for us to be connected, uh, for, us to, for us to be connected as employer, employee, you know, colleagues, is, is, that, is that important? If it's important, then you have to be intentional about how you're going to do it. You have to put together a plan. And that takes time. It needs to be time invested, you know, uh, not just in the workplace, but sometimes outside the workplace. And, again, I, I, I see you as a person. If we can, if we can establish that um, with employees and there's real authentic connection and caring there, even though the stakes are high, I mean, and, and it's all about – it's a production business. Uh, if you really believe that uh, that that uh, the connection is important, um, then you know you have to invest time. You have to invest time, and you know that goes to that goes to resiliency, um, and that's uh, and that, that's one of the things that I think that that people are. are that's kind of what we're we're seeing and we're, what we're feeling that maybe we're not. Our organizations are not as resilient. Uh, as maybe they once were, what we want them to be, and resiliency is the way we see it. is is basically like the the uh, you have a like a, a a wheel with spokes. You have the individual in the middle, and then the spokes are all the all the connections uh, that that individual has. And the more real connections that that individual has, that that individual is going to be be more resilient. Um, they're going to be able to adapt. Uh, they're going to be able to adjust. They're going to be ready to you know, overcome adversity. Um, you know, they're going to be able to. Uh, you're going to be able to when you get knocked down. You know, get back up, and and that's because of the authentic uh, connections that they have. The more of those that you have, the the more resilient your, your the individual is going to be. The more resilient your organization is going to be. And you have to really you have to really uh, work at that. I, I think COVID exposed that. If not, yeah. it, was, it, was the, it was the, what, highest economy in the history of this con- country before COVID hit. Yep. And uh, true, to the, true to the statement, hard times make hard men. So, <laughs> yes. Coach, I cannot thank you enough, and those were, those were great questions. We do end this on two questions, yeah. and this is just, man, you've laid so many nuggets that I'm, I, I've got two pages of notes here, um, which I'm totally going to steal your material. <laughs> so... Uh, sorry, not sorry. Hey, it's, um, it's all I'll, yours. I'll, I'll credit you. I'll credit <laughs> you. So, uh, two questions are: one is how is Mel T- Tucker going to evaluate whether he lived a good life, a life of purpose, a life of impact? Yeah, um, it's going to be with my with my two boys, uh, Kristen and Joseph. Um, you know, when I'm gone, when they when people ask them about me, um, you know, what they say um, is going to be you know, it's going to be my legacy because you, you can't fool the kids and they they know and they see you and uh, and uh, and that's that's really where the rubber meets the road. For everyone that just heard that, looking at all you've accomplished, that probably sounds insane to them. <laughs> that you could do away with all the accolades. Oh, that's shit, what. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, I mean, I'm a glorified PE teacher is what I am. <laughs> you, you a, well, a well-paid PE teacher. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's why I am. But, you know, uh, you know when, I, I, when, I look at, when I look at my dad, you know, I, I can remember growing up, my, my, I'm named after my dad. So 
So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Mel. My dad's name is Mel. He's Mel Sr. And, uh, and, you know, people would come up to me and say, are you Mel Tucker's son? Is your dad Mel Tucker to play at Toledo? And I, and I say, yeah. And then they would say, oh, he's such a great guy. He's so nice. I love, you know, but, and I, I heard that my entire life, my entire life. I never heard one person say one negative word about my, about my, about my old man. And, uh, and so that's how I see my dad, you know, and uh, he's just a he's just a great man. And I, he's you know my hero growing up. He's, you know, he's my, my superhero, you know, and he still is to this day. And so um, I know that my I know that my kids, um, you know, even though they get older and they don't talk to you as much and, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. got their own. Deal it's a going. Yeah, they got. Yeah, they got that. Go, but I know that they're that they're that they're watching. And uh, and so it's important for me to. Uh, you know, at the end of the day to, uh, you know, to, you know, at least, uh, you know, have, you know, earn their respect. And, and, you know, you've mentioned your dad and I know your mom's still alive. Yep. Uh, is, is, is Mel yeah. senior still with us? Yep. Yep. They're, okay. they're, my mom and my dad are both, uh, they're, they live in, they live in Cleveland Heights. And my, well, I have two, two, uh, younger brothers. We're all eight years apart. One of them, uh, lives in, uh, South in Medina, Ohio. And my other brother's out in, out in LA, but it's uh, it feels good to uh, to be you know closer to Close. closer to family. Does, does he still attend a game or two? Yeah, he he'll get to the game when, when you know he takes care of my mom. But you know when we can get someone to take care of my mom, he'll he'll come on up to a you know he'll he'll get to some games and uh, and um, he he loves it. You know I just I just ordered him a, a peach bowl ring. You know he. He said, "Do you guys get rings?" I said, "He said I saw you guys got rings," and I said, "Yeah." He says, "Well, where's my ring?" You know, so <laughs> yeah, he's kind of li- living through uh, living through me a little bit. So uh, yeah, we uh, yeah, they're, they're still kicking. I, I, I he's got to be both of them have to be two proud parents, man. What are those one to three keys to success? Those non negotiables for all the viewers and listeners yep. that have been the key to your success today. Yep. Yeah, um, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, don't be, uh, you know, don't be, don't be scared. You know, like, I mean, if if you're scared, that's okay, but you still got to do it. You still, you still got to get out there. You still got to be. You still got to. You got to take some risk. You know, you got you. You have to take some risk. You get. You have to bet on yourself. You can't sit back. And just wait and, and, and hope something falls into your lap. You know, uh, the other thing for me is um, you got to be a sponge. You know, pay attention. Success leaves clues. There's people around you that are successful in whatever they're doing. You know, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is. There are people that are, that are winning. They're successful. You come in contact with those people. You, you see them. Uh, you, you can read about them. They, they leave clues. They're doing certain things that that, that works, and 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 uh, you know, be a sponge and and and, and learn and, and take take some of those things that are gonna you know are gonna work for you, or maybe you say, hey, I'm not doing that. Maybe I need to. Maybe I should be doing that and, and, and start implementing those things, um, because um, it's a reason why they're winning in life. You know, there's a reason. And then, uh, and then lastly, I would I would say, I mean, there's there's a, you know. There's no substitute for for good old fashioned elbow grease and hard work. I mean, it's it, it's just. I mean, I, I'm old school that way, um, you know. And I I mean, I believe in rest. I believe in sleep. I believe in recovery. I believe in all. I I really do. I mean, I, I mean, I'm at my best when I'm when I'm rested. But when I'm going, when you go, go. You know, work. You know, work out. You can out. You can outwork people. Period, and you know, not necessarily work longer, but you know, work smarter. But if you can work longer and smarter, you know, then then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have a chance. In a world full of hacks, where everyone's looking for a shortcut, um, it, well, I mean, I call it yeah, instant gratification. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially with, with social media, is just sort of reinforce that, yeah. uh, both the good and the bad. Well, dude, uh, Mel, I cannot thank you enough for 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 joining us. This is, this is gold, man. And, and people need to listen to you. I, teenagers need to listen to this. The sons and daughters. Um, I mean, you just said it. Sponge, pay attention. You've been highly successful and you're leaving clues right now within this, uh, this podcast. I'm going to tell you this. Um, I, I probably got more Michigan friends 
than Michigan State fans, but you have just recruited another fan, and I, I'm going to be watching this season uh, closely from Austin, Texas, uh, rooting for you and the program and the culture that you're building. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you having, having me on, and, and uh, I enjoy sharing, and I've, I've learned, a, I learned a lot from you as well, and so I, I'm just uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Well, to all of you, uh, thank you for joining us again, the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior podcast, and we will see you again.